Hello and welcome back. Since day one, we are using compute in order to run instructions or code that we are writing in our notebook. Now, what exactly is this compute? You can just understand compute as in basic terms as the data processing capability that you have in Databricks workspace. Sometimes you might have also heard a term called cluster. Compute are also referred as clusters, which we use generally in order to run our jobs in Databricks. Today, we are going to see what all different type of options that we have in compute in Databricks. Now, before that, if you have not seen our previous video, I would recommend you to go back and watch them first. So, without any delay, let's begin. I am in my Databricks workspace. Now, on the left hand side of the sidebar, the fifth option that you can see is compute. Let's go into it. Now, once you are on the compute page, you can see a lot of options provided at the top. Now, we are not going to discuss about all of them, but today we are going to discuss about some of the important ones, which are all purpose compute and job compute. In our upcoming videos, we will discuss about SQL pools, policies, and SQL warehouses. So, first one that we are going to discuss about is all purpose compute. Now, by default, you should already be on the page of all purpose compute. Now, here you can see two options. The first one is create with personal compute, and another one is the generic one, which is called as create compute. Now, you can use Databricks APIs also to create compute, but today we are going to see this through UI. So, once you are on the page of all-purpose compute, just go ahead and click on the button which is called Create Compute. Once you click that button called Create Compute, you will be on a page where you can see a lot of options about compute. Now, you don't need to worry about it. We are going to discuss about all of them now one by one. The first option that you see on the top is the name of the cluster. Now, what exactly is a cluster? We already know that cluster are a group of machines. It means some of the machines which are combined together to process or to work on your job. Right, So that is a cluster and in a Spark we know that we have one driver and you can have more than one workers. Right, So that's a cluster. So first option that you see here is to name the cluster. Right, You can just go ahead and click on this edit button and you can change the name. For example, I'll just give it as demo cluster. Right, So once we are done with this, you can change the name here. Then the next option that you see is policy. Now what is a policy? Policy is basically in Databricks is to restrict or is to define a way in which you define a compute. So the first policy by default selected is unrestricted. It means you can go ahead and design any type of cluster that you want. You do not have any type of restriction, right? Now, once you click this drop down, you can see all other different policies that are by default available for you. Now, we are going to discuss about all of them, but for now, we will just stick around with unrestricted. Now, the other two options that you see here is multi-node and single node, right? So multi-node means you will have more than one machines assigned at your cluster. But once you change this to single node, you will see you don't have any other option to have more than one node. So let's go ahead with multi-node first. So once I do that, you can see other options are enabled by default, right? The next option that you see is access mode. So once you select a multi-node, you have multiple options like single user, shared, or no isolation shared, right? So these are the access modes that are defined after Unity Catalog. So the first two options that you see are Unity Catalog enabled. It means if you select any of the first two options, this is supported by Unity Catalog. But the third option is not supported by Unity Catalog. Now we are going to see all of them one by one. First option that is selected is single user. Right? It means this cluster will be enabled for only a single user. So you can see the user selected by default. Right? This is the user I'm logged in with. But if you want to change the user for which this cluster would be designed, you can just go ahead and type the username. So if I type E, you can see E's data and I can go ahead and select this. So once you select this, and if you click on this I button, it already tells you that all the Azure Active Directory credentials for this user would by default be passed on Azure Data Lake Storage. Okay, So this would be the secure way in which this user can use the Unity Catalog objects. Right. So the next option is shared. It means multiple users can use this cluster. And again, this is Unity Catalog enabled. So once you click on shared, you don't see any options for user. It means all of the users who have access to this cluster can go ahead and use this. And it would work with Unity Catalog objects as well. Right. So let's go ahead and select the access mode as shared first. Next option that you see is Databricks runtime version. Now, this is what we call as DBR, which stands for Databricks runtime. Now, what exactly it is? Now, if I click on this drop down, you can see a lot of options available. There are different options for standard and there are different options for ML. So if you are working with ML, you have to go ahead and select ML and you have to select different runtime versions. Okay. Now, if you are not working with ML, you can go ahead and select the standard and you can go ahead and select the one that you need. No, it is always advised to use the latest one LTS that is available. The reason is LTS stands for long term support. And what exactly is this Databricks runtime? This Databricks runtime is a pre-packaged image with all of the different Spark versions, Scala and Python and all other necessary libraries, plus all other fixes for the bugs that are there from the previous version. Okay. So once you select this version, this image would by default be installed on your cluster on the workers and the drivers. So you don't have to worry about different type of library installations in order to work. Right. So you can see 
15.4 is the latest LTS. So let me just go ahead and select this. Now it says it is with Spark 3.5.0 and the Scala version is 2.12. Okay. Once I select this, you can go ahead and see the runtime version being selected here. So you can go ahead and change this as well. So if you use 14.3 LTS, you can see it is changing here on the right hand side. Right now, the next option that you see is Photon Acceleration. Now, Photon is a runtime engine that Databricks designed with C++. Now, the benefit of Photon is it gives way faster execution for the Photon enabled jobs. Okay. Now, in case of Spark, sometimes a job might run slow, but once the Photon is enabled, the jobs might run very much faster when the Photon is enabled. Okay. Now, there is a documentation available on Databricks where you can go ahead and learn about Photon. So if I scroll down, it is very much enabled for data ingestion, ETL, streaming, data science, and interactive queries. Okay. So you can go ahead and enable Photons for the requirement of your jobs as well. Now, once you check this Photon, you will also see the Photon tag added to the summary of your cluster. Okay. But once you disable this, you'll see the Photon tags goes away. Okay. But you need to know that the Photon comes with a little bit of cost. So once you enable this, you can see the cost increasing here, 6 to 8 DVUs, right? If I disable this, this goes to 6 to 9 DVUs. So the Photon comes with a little bit of cost that you have to keep in mind. Okay. Now, the next options are very important. These are the workers and the driver types. And the option here that you see is the VM type that Azure offers. Okay. So if I click on this, you can see a lot of VM options available here. Right. You can see standard ADS, which are Delta Cache Accelerated, which is general purpose. Right. If I scroll down, you can see the normal general purpose. So, for example, let me just select DS4 V2. OK. And you can see the information about that VM as well. It is 28 GB memory and 8 cores. So you can very well select the type of VM that you need as per your memory requirement or as per your core requirement. OK. Now, there are other options available. For example, if you need some memory optimized job where memory should be high, the number of cores should be low. You can just go ahead and select the memory optimized VM. OK. Now. Here are two different other options that you can see. The first one is minimum workers. The second one is maximum workers. Now, this is called auto scaling. What happens is if you define the minimum number of workers and the maximum number of workers, your job will start with the minimum number of workers. And as and when the requirement increases, it will scale up to the maximum number of workers you have defined. OK, and this is what is auto scaling, which is a feature that is available with Databricks. So if you are unsure that how much consumption is required, you can very well enable auto scaling from this option. Now, if I uncheck this, you can see that option been gone. Okay. Now, here it is fixed. If I say one, means now my worker will only be one. It means my cluster would be one driver and one worker. But if I enable auto scaling, my cluster would start with, say, two workers and can go up to eight workers. Right. So if I scroll up on the summary, you can also see it can go up from four DBUs up till 14 DBUs per hour. Right. But if you uncheck the auto scaling, and if you select the number of workers, for example, as two, and if you scroll up, it gives you a fixed amount of DBU, which is 4.5 DBU per hour, right? It means the number of workers will now be fixed. You will have one driver and you will have two workers. Now, if I scroll down, you can very well select the type of driver as well. Okay. Now you can just let it be with the same as the worker type, or you can select a different type of driver. And once you are done with the selection of cluster for the all purpose compute, you get one more option, which is called terminate after. This helps you save cluster. Once you enable this and you provide the number of minutes, if your cluster is ideal for that number of minutes, it will automatically be killed. OK, and this is the very good option to save cost. You have to keep in mind if you are designing an all purpose compute, please check this terminate after and give it a minute. For example, if you want to kill your cluster after 10 minutes to avoid cost. So if you're not doing anything on your cluster and your cluster is sitting ideal, automatically get killed after 10 minutes. OK, so this option saves a lot of cost. For example, I would let it be 30 minutes. And once this is done, you have different other options like tags. You can go ahead and supply this. For example, I'll just say owner of this cluster is ease with data. OK, so tags are very much important if you are planning to drill down into the cluster cost. Now you have more other options like if I click on this advanced option and if I scroll down, you can see different options like here. You can pass on Spark configs to your cluster and here you can pass on environment variables. OK, other than this, there is logging information that you can do. For example, if you want to save logs into DBFS, you can just go ahead and select DBFS and you can provide path here. Once you do this, all the cluster logs will get saved to this particular DBFS location. Similarly, there are init scripts. Now, we are not going to discuss about init scripts for now. We are almost done with our cluster configuration for all purpose, right? So the only one that is left is no isolation. So I will just go ahead and select no isolation now. And you can see the Unity catalog tag is gone from the right hand side. Right. Again, this type of cluster is basically used for legacy workloads, which are still running on Hive Metastore. And these are again shared by multiple users where there is no isolation between. Them. So it is very important that when you migrate to Unity Catalog, you just go ahead and select shared cluster. If multiple users are using the same cluster or single user cluster, if you are only using that cluster and no one else is going to use that. OK, so let me just go ahead and select shared now. And I will just scroll down and I'll click on create compute. 
So as soon as I do that, you can see the screen mark running, right? So I'll just not turn on this computer. So I'll click on terminate. But you can see on the top, there are different other options available. Okay. So if I click on libraries, here you can attach libraries that has to install on this cluster. For example, if you want to install any zar file or if you want to install any wheel file from Python, you can just go ahead and click on install new and give the path of the volume where the file lies. So once this cluster will start, automatically this libraries will get installed. The next option is event log. So this is where you can see if you have an auto scaling cluster enabled, this is where you can see the step up and step down for these clusters. Okay. How many worker nodes are available? How many are being added? How many are being removed? Okay. So all those informations will come in this event log. The next one is Spark UI. And this is the most important one. So once this cluster is up and running, you can see the Spark UI. And this is where you can go ahead and debug your jobs. For example, any job which is running on this demo cluster, you can just go to the Spark UI and you can see the job information in Spark UI. The next one is driver log. Here you can see all the logs available. So you can see standard out, standard error, and the log 4J for this particular cluster available. And the other one important is the metrics. Now I'll show this metrics to you right away in the cluster that we created previously. Okay, so I'll go back to compute and I'll open the ease with data's cluster and I'll go to metrics. Now you can see here, right? Here you have different options like CPU utilization, memory utilization, all of the options are available. And this helps you to very much debug how much memory you are consuming, how much CPU usage is happening, okay? You have other options like hardware, Spark or GPU. You can just go ahead and select and you can see all the information here. Similarly, if I go to Spark UI, it will load the older UI that you have. So here you can see all the options for Spark UI is available. Now, the one more tab that you can see is notebook, which is disabled, which gives you an option to see how many notebooks are connected to this particular cluster. Okay, now that you understand everything about this cluster, let me just go back to compute and the important part. I'll click on this three dot and I'll click on edit permissions. You can see here, if I click on this, I can give users or groups or service principal access to this cluster, right? But if I click on this drop down, you can see there are only three options available for a particular cluster. The first one is can manage, means if you give any user permission of can manage, it means they can very well delete your cluster or edit your cluster. Okay, but if you give can restart, it means they can only start your cluster or stop your cluster. They cannot edit the cluster or they cannot delete anything from that cluster. But if you give only can attach to, it means they can only attach their notebooks or SQL scripts or they can only run the jobs using your cluster. But they cannot stop, start or they cannot edit or manage your cluster. Okay, so there are three different type of permissions available on a cluster. You can very well select the users group or service principal to whom you need to provide that access. Okay. Now that we have created one of our cluster, let's go ahead and see other options for policies that were available in that cluster. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and click on create compute. And this time on unrestricted one, you can see single node, right? Once I select the single node, you can see a lot of options gone. Like for example, you cannot see auto scaling. It means you can only create a cluster with only one node. Okay, and you can see that is the driver node, right? So this is a single node cluster. Okay, that you can go ahead and create. Similarly, this single node cluster can be used by a single user or shared or for no isolation. Okay, you have three access modes available. This is all on unrestricted, but there are some predefined policies that Databricks gives you. So once you select this predefined policy, all of the options are auto-filled or some of the options are auto-filled. For example, if I select our personal compute and I click on confirm, you can see this becomes single user cluster, which is of only one node, right? Policies are basically nothing but subset of unrestricted, right? So if you select unrestricted, if you select single node and access mode as single user, it is same as the policy of personal compute. Right. So if I go ahead and select on shared compute now, if I click on confirm, this is nothing but multi node with the shared access mode. Right. You get an option for auto scaling here that you can very well change. OK. Now, if I click on this again and if I select on power user compute and if I click on this, you can see you can get options for a different access mode. But this time you get auto scaling. Right. So these policies are nothing but the subsets of unrestricted one, which are predefined for you so that you don't have to do everything from scratch. Right. Similarly, if I click on this drop down and select the legacy shared one and I click on confirm, you can see this time this is not Unity catalog enabled, right? So this is nothing but a multi node cluster with a access mode of no isolation and you get options with auto scaling, right? So these are all the predefined policies that are already provided for you. So next time, if you want to design a shared compute, you can go ahead and very well select this and you can click on confirm and you can go ahead and design the compute from here. You don't have to worry about going into unrestricted and filling out all other informations. Right. So policy makes our job a lot easier. It also restricts some of the information. For example, if I go to personal compute, if I click on confirm and if I click on this node type, you can very well see only three type of nodes are available. There are no other nodes available. It means it restricted all other things. So you can use policies in order to restrict things. 
right? You can very well design your custom policies as well. So if I click on this compute, if I go to policies, here you can go ahead and create a policy for yourself. Once you create a policy, you can go ahead and use this policy next time to create compute or force computes which are already running to use this policy. Okay, and we are going to see about policies in our later videos. For today, we have already seen what are all the all-purpose compute. Okay, the next option that you see is job compute. Job computes are nothing but are the computes which are created on the runtime while you run your job. For example, you don't want all-purpose compute to run your job, right? You need some compute which should start up as soon as you trigger your job and should shut down once your job is complete. And for that purpose, job compute is used. And it is always recommended to use job compute if you're running your jobs because the job computes will automatically turn off as soon as your job is complete or your job fails. Okay, so you cannot go ahead and create job compute from here. We will see how to create job computes when we work with workflows. So in workflows, you have option to create a job compute. You define the type of compute that you need. And once you trigger your job, it will automatically create a compute here and it will run the job in that compute. And once that is done, it will kill that compute. Similarly, the next time you again run that workflow, it will again create one new compute with that same configuration and it will turn off as soon as you are done with your job. Right. So that is the purpose of job compute. And this is how it is different from all purpose compute. Okay. So all purpose computes are basically used when you want to do something interactive. For example, you want to run your notebook, you want to run your SQL manually, or if you want to run a job manually, then you can run a job using all purpose compute. But these are something that you do interactive. Okay. But job computes are basically used to run your jobs. Okay. Now you might be thinking that this is too much to learn about compute. And that is right. Now Databricks offers something which is called serverless compute, which we will see in our upcoming videos. And that reduces of all the efforts that we have done while designing our compute okay in serverless compute you don't need to worry about designing your compute you just select serverless compute and you run your jobs automatically the compute would be determined by databricks in the background you don't have to worry about it and that is the benefit of serverless compute and we are going to see serverless compute in our upcoming video now next video we are going to discuss about pools and policies till then keep learning keep growing and keep sharing